Stay hungry, stay foolish. The fast-moving, up-and-down economy we live in makes keeping companies afloat increasingly difficult. Just as we handle one crisis, another one appears. Digital, millennials, new regulations, new competition, political turmoil, artificial intelligence, industry 4.0, blockchain, sharing economy, circular economy, substitute products, you name it, the waves of disruption come crashing faster and faster, fundamentally changing the way we work, profit, and compete. For nearly 20 years, our guest today has worked in the field of survival and sustainability, researching and developing ways for businesses and people to stay afloat no matter what the disruption. To understand the mechanics of survival, it helps to look at the successes and the failures of the past. We welcome author of Titanic Syndrome, Why Companies Sink and How to Reinvent Your Way Out of Any Business Disaster, Dr. Nadia Jekzembayeva. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And you did a beautiful job with my name. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, let the listener in that I practiced a few times with you coaching me. It's great to have you on the show. Let's share a bit about you and your deep relationship with change, which goes way back before your birth. It's my honor to be here. And my personal story has been buried under my academic and business story for so many years until about a couple of years ago, a few friends get me got me into a meeting and had an intervention and said you need to start sharing the personal story because it makes everything else completely different it creates a frame of reference that is completely different so i was born in the soviet union i come from a family on both sides of my mother and father line of dissidents political dissidents so my relationship to change started long before i was born And realizing that throughout my young years and young adulthood, I was prepared to survive change because so many of my recent ancestors, so my grandparents, my great-grandparents did not survive, was a revelation to me as well as I was coming to adulthood. So I come from a history of turbulence where in Kazakhstan, my home country, 40% of population was artificially murdered through a, a famine, a man-made famine, government-made famine, to control the population. And beautiful studies, most cruel kind of studies were done and published on how do you do it more efficiently, how do you kill people through artificial famines more efficiently. You can go and research dissertations were written on this, um, which is a very cynical and painful chapter of our history. And then, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, all of those massive turbulences in my homeland and in my family life laid the foundation of having real focus on what it means to survive and what it means to thrive. And it's one of the reasons I really made an effort with your name, because your name has a real meaning behind it. And it's one of the ways we met before on Cody Royal's podcast, where others won't. And in that, you mentioned the meaning of your name, which is really important as well. I'd love to mention that. I married a man from a different tradition, who I love very much, and I'm very thankful. But uh, of course, everyone asks me, why did I keep my name when I had an alternative? And especially since most of my life is spent in a Western English-speaking world. I live in the United States. I went to study 21 years ago. So why would I stand up for a name that is exceptionally difficult to pronounce, very hard to comprehend? And it's very simple. Uh, my name represents a history of my family. And our culture name tells a story of where are you from? When were you born? What caste, if you will? We have three big groups that you can say they are castes. Um, what caste you belong to, what geography you represent, what gender, what social status, and so on. And knowing how many people died for this name, an idea of just casting it aside for convenience was unbearable. So I stick with my name because so many people 
actually invested their life into this name. And recently I had a conversation with my dad about the purpose of life and how do you assess were you successful or not? Because if you look at my grandparents and my parents, especially my granddad, because he was a son of the enemy of the state, his parents were executed. He grew up in an orphanage house in Russia so that he would forget his language. He was uh, prosecuted all throughout his life, tortured until he killed himself. He was 42, I think, about my age when he killed himself after another prison bout. And if I was him, I would not wait until I was in my 40s. I would kill myself very early on because there was absolutely no visual representation of the purpose and meaning in my life. But he didn't. So that I could stomp around all over the world, do whatever I want with my life. And the purpose and meaning of his life realized only two generations later. So when I feel like I'm not doing something meaningful, when any of uh, the listeners feel like they're not doing something meaningful, you might be doing something incredible 100 years from now, and you don't even know it. And the fact that you're fighting it will give a foundation for generations to come, and you would not know it, but the meaning is a much more long-term. I mentioned to you when we met first, it's a blockchain name, as in the record is in the name, and it does not go away. And you've respected that, and I love that. But it reminds me, last night, only last night, I was put my kids to bed, and I showed them a picture of this amazing child who is a competitive athlete, and she has no legs. And I said, you guys have to appreciate. When we ask you, we need to walk, or when you're getting tired, you need to appreciate what you have you have legs, you're able to walk, you're healthy. And I told my older son, who's nine, the quote by Dr. Wayne Dyer, may he rest in peace, which is, when you change what you see, what you see changes. And it really, really meant something to my older son, which was fantastic, because I want to plant those seeds for the future. That's so beautiful. That is really, really beautiful. And yes, blockchain name was such a beautiful metaphor. You were spot on. It's absolutely a history and a record of a different moment in history coded in a particular portion of a name that doesn't ever go away. So it, it stays with you, which I think uh, one of the things that I love about blockchain uh, economy and blockchain technology is the idea that we can assure continuity in a transparent way because all of us who work in the field of change management we tend to love and obsess the change part of the story, which I think is most energetic, perhaps. But the most powerful part of the story is not change, it's continuity. It's not what do we change. That's usually very obvious, what's not working. But what do we keep? What do we preserve? Continuity management is incredibly more difficult, I think, than change management. Let's use that to get into the book because you've crowdsourced this book. So in the real nature of a chief reinvention officer, which you are. You've crowdsourced the book. You've reinvented the concept of a business book. Let's share a word on that of how you've done that and how you've done it differently. Just to give you a context, let me dissect who are we. I founded together with my husband 12 years ago, a reinvention agency, which is a company that does hands-on full-service reinvention, usually in the case of crisis, occasionally not. Uh, for businesses and sometimes for small countries or big cities or something like that. So we are full service. It means we don't consult. We don't give advice. We actually live with you through the whole process until the system is stable again. And uh, about four or five years ago, we were no longer able to accept new clients because the need is growing. So more and more of our potential clients or old clients started asking us, can you please then train people inside the company to do this. Because if you cannot do it yourself, can you train us how to do it? And we started this journey of creating uh, materials, frameworks, uh, tools, and a kind of comprehensive tool set of what it means to reinvent a company out of a disaster. So when we thought that it's time to put all these tools together in a book, I had by then already a couple of experiences of writing books with uh, established uh, publishing houses. My first book was with Stanford 
Business Press. The second one was Barrett Kohler. Both of those houses are established, more or less traditional and so on. And the traditional approach to writing a book as follows. You spend a couple of years developing the concept and testing it in your academic or professional life. That's usually two to five years, depending on the person. For example, one of my all-time favorites, Good to Great, was a research of over five years before the writing started. So it's many years of development of content. Then you sell the concept. And in my case, selling of the concept was anywhere between uh, six to 12 months. Then you finally sign the contract. Then you start writing in manuscript. You are given at least one year to do so. And then when the manuscript is complete, usually there is at least another year of getting into production. So if you put it all together, even the fastest books, with the exceptions of really special cases, even the fastest books are two years old by the time you get them. And you think you're reading the fresh idea, where in reality is the earliest if been developed is two years before you got this book in your hands. And most likely it's actually five, six or seven years. So we realized that it doesn't make sense to write a book about speed of change, but write it um, five years later. And after brainstorming it with a lot of people, and now we go to second part of what we are. So we exist for invention agency. We started a nonprofit pro bono knowledge platform called Chief Reinvention Officer, where we share as much of resources as we can free with free trainings, free videos, free resources, because we think this knowledge needs to become radically inclusive. So together with that community, we were brainstorming solutions and it emerged as an idea to create a living book, a book that is written in pieces and republished every three months and delivered virtually so that every two to three months you get a new content and the updates on the previous content. You get new tools, you get new insights. If there is a current case we're working on, we try to put it in. Currently, a few people used ideas in the February edition of the book. We're trying to write cases with them on how they use those ideas and what happened. So it's a very much a living organism that is republished as a new edition with completely new content every few months. One of the reasons I mentioned that is for me, and I'm sure, and I'm, I have no doubt for you, it's very, very reflective of business plans and business models because by the time some change maker, some in, reinvention officer within a big corporate, particularly the older, gets a project idea through, a project plan through, it's often out of date. And it reminds me of that concept of painting the Golden Gate Bridge. By the time you get to the end, you need to start again. And this is what happens with so many five-year strategies or five-year plans. You can't have a five-year plan in this world. You need a five-year direction, perhaps, but you need a constantly evolving, agile business model, business plan, and have to adapt to it all the time. And business is just not built that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will tell you two funny anecdotes. So one of them was with the CEO of a very major retail agriculture integrated business, multi-billion in Europe. And he said to me uh, recently, he said, Nadia, you work with many different companies. And of course, you work with banks. With banks. Can you please tell me, when we are applying for our loans and we are writing that business plan, We know it's garbage because conditions change constantly. So whatever assumptions we put in are irrelevant in a matter of a few weeks. So we know it's garbage. And the people in the banks are very smart people. So I have no doubt they know it's garbage as well. Why do we keep doing this? And a different conversation or a different case and anecdote is uh, a couple of years ago in 2014, 2015, I was working with a very large mining company. And we worked so hard through the three months, many round traditional budget process that this company had at that time. And by end of the year, November, early December, the company had a budget and the board approved the budget on early December 2014. And exactly one month later, the commodity prices and the commodity markets opened right after New Year on 2nd or 3rd of January. And the price for 
all major metals, and especially iron ore, fell more than 50%. That budget was nothing. <laughs> so hundreds of people worked through many months to create something that has absolutely no relevance and makes absolutely no help or support in decision-making. So we simply have to figure out how do we move towards emergent strategy as a practical tool and dynamic budgeting as a practical tool. Otherwise, we will forever wake up in shambles, struggling to figure out how to survive. The other thing, Nadia, is to the listener, this is so relevant to the person as well, because what are companies but masses of individual people? Let's share a little bit on that, because I know it's part and parcel of what you do as well. I come from the field of organizational behavior, and I often ask my students, what's the difference between organizational behavior and HR, for example? Um, If you look at the topics that the field study, change management, uh, motivation, group dynamics, it's very similar topics. So the difference is in the perspective because HR comes from the old mechanistic idea of what business is. And the central issue of HR is how do we use people for the sake of organization? That's why we even call people headcount. We don't call him people. In the HR speak, it's headcount as if only head counts at the work and the body is just a vehicle to bring head to work. Um, I come from an alternative, a, a, a field that showed up as a, um, as a revolution or as an opposition to HR. And the central principle of OB is the other way around. How do we use organizing for the sake of human? So for me, there is no separation between business and an individual because, as you say, business is a collection of individuals. But the story of surviving crisis and reinvention and the speed of change is even more relevant for a human being, especially because we are set up to fail, unfortunately, by our current education system and societal norms. Um, And let me clarify here. For the most of the history of the recent capitalism, so about 200 years, the life cycles of business was very long. And therefore, we were preparing our young kids and then adults and then mature professionals to live in those long cycles. That meant that you would have only one career. Most likely, you would have only one company that you work for. It was very unusual for people in the 20th century to switch companies a lot. And you will never see major transformation. Our education system was built around that as well. We educate people out of change and reinvention because it was unnecessary. So we teach kids in the early, early age to sit down and shut up in every culture, regardless of religion, political affiliation, economic belief. I grew up in an atheistic communist society. You grew up in a capitalist society. I bet you both of us on the first day of school were told to sit down and shut up. So now we have to wake up and realize that that was wonderful perhaps or not, but it's no longer longer relevant. We have to learn how to live in a fast speed of change. We have to figure out how to ride the waves of change rather than be constantly crushed by it. And that is a personal story. Because no longer we will work for one company and no longer we'll have one career. We'll have to reinvent again and again and again. Beautiful. And a huge essence of this show is that idea that change is not just at an organizational level, it's an individual level. And this show is also for parents as well. So yes, you're C-suite executives, CEOs, entrepreneurs, but you're humans and maybe you have children and those children need to be fed new information because they're not unfortunately getting it from the education system. So let's get into it, Nadia. Let's get into Titanic Syndrome. And I thought a great way to introduce it before you bring new insights to the story that a lot of us are aware of is to define what Titanic Syndrome is. Well, Titanic Syndrome is a term we made up to explain to ourselves as a community why so many companies facing potential change are not able to survive it and essentially bring down their own demise. So we would come to help a company, and the company would fight tooth and nail to stay as it is and die. 
And we wanted to understand the mechanics of how this happens. And through a collaborative effort, we realized that the stories we shared case after case of a company that killed itself, some of those cases you know very well, Nokia, Kodak, Sears, Blockbuster, and some of the stories people don't know, there are other companies, but there are mass amount of companies that were not able to survive change. They all shared similarities with the famous story of Titanic, of what exactly happened on Titanic. So what is Titanic syndrome? The current definition, because it is a living definition that we update regularly, the current definition is the following. Titanic syndrome is a corporate or individual disease in which organizations facing disruption create their own downfall through arrogance or excessive attachment to the past success or a simple inability to recognize the new and emerging reality. Those are the three markers that we have discovered so far through research, that it's either one of those or a combination of two or three. And let's dive into those three markers individually. So the first then you mentioned was arrogance. Absolutely. Arrogance is often perceived as something that is very visually noticeable. Unfortunately, in most cases in business setting, it's not always an individually shown trait that an individual is behaving in an arrogant way. No, it's more of an organizational tacit assumption that we're too big to fail. We're too good to fail. We've done this before. And we see in the meetings, in the discussions, in the assumptions, implicit most of the time assumptions, uh, a kind of uh, assumption of superiority, untouchability, unsinkability. And then on a personal level, it shows up as a kind of belief that I have a great track record, I'm an amazing professional, I will not be touched by anything, I'm untouchable. And you mentioned earlier on about sometimes you have clients who aren't sinking or they're not in trouble. And that really jumped out at me because those clients who are the ones who are actually doing well right now are the ones who start to reinvent themselves when things are going well. And it shows a distinct lack of arrogance. This is the main message of the whole book. At this speed of change, you cannot afford to wait until it becomes obvious. And statistics are very clear. So if you look at the Fortune 500, the untouchable and unsinkable titans of business of the 20th century, the original Fortune 500 list from the 1950s. Out of that list, 88% of companies are gone. They either bankrupt or they were acquired in a less than pretty way. They were not able to sustain themselves and they were not able to thrive. That's a, that's a span of about 60 years. But recent research, there's a wonderful group called InnoSight that just published their analysis of Standard and Poor 500. And their insight is that in the next decade, not 50, not 60 years, but just in the next 10 years, about 50% of all standard and poor 500 will be gone. We are looking at the speed of change in which the only way to survive it is to reinvent ahead of the curve, ahead of the necessity. And there is a great book called Stall Points that showed that if you start reinventing on a decline, when you start to save in your company the crisis management uh, effort at the time where your performance is already in the decline, whether you measure it by profitability, market share, or anything else. Your chances of ever reaching back to the peak of your performance, historical performance, is only 10%. That's it. That's pretty much done. If you reinvent on the decline, at that point, the budgets are already tight, the political will is not there, the emotions are running all through fear, the system doesn't have resources to start a new curve. So you always have to reinvent before it's too late. And that means you have to create a system in which reinvention is a norm, is a part of a process, is a normal part of your life. That one right there, we often think of that as business, if we even do, of, of businesses doing it when things are going well. But for me, that's so important for people listening to this show when your career is going well. Because to try and get a job when maybe your relevance in a role has decreased or maybe your job is done. Because I certainly believe most of our roles in companies is actually to put ourselves out of a role in a way that we've given so much that we can't do anymore. And then 
when you feel that's coming a year before, maybe you start looking elsewhere. And I think the biggest blocker, Nadia, I don't know about you, but I find the biggest blocker for people is what others will think. What will my parents think? What will my spouse think? What will my friends think? What will people in the company think? They'll think that maybe I've lost it or maybe I'm not doing as well. But the confidence to do that can mean better salaries and more happiness. Absolutely. I think you're making a crucial, crucial point. In our lifetime, and you and I, when we were growing up, we were told one story about our retirement, and I'm sure you revisited and revised that story. You and I are both expected to have another, I don't know, 40, 50 years of productive life because we're expected to have a productive life well into 80s, 90s, if not later. So that means we have to start thinking of our life as a cycle. And instead of deciding on what do I want to do in life, decide on what do I want to do in the next five years? What do I want this five years or three years or seven years to be about and be proactively designing our life rather than being victims of economic crisis, changes in the company, changes in regulations, and so on. And those of you who are listening from the political spectrum, the same applies to cycles in the cities, in communities, in countries. By the time our city is no longer able to sustain itself because the economic reality makes it unviable, it's too late to try to reinvent the city. It's done. And the people are doomed and left to Caesar, a Caesar with hope and despair and very, very proactive uh, political unrest. So we have to reinvent before it's necessary. And yes, it is crucial to figure out, okay, how do I get a support system? If I'm living in an environment in which everyone will think that I'm going crazy, that I have a midlife crisis number three or whatever else, um, how do I create an environment in which I support? Number one is building a community in which you can safely have a discussion. And for me, myself, the online community we created through our Free platform has been invaluable because when I'm doubting, I have a good 500 people I can go back to and say, guys, um, this is not working. Help me. And if I have something to vent about, because if I'm in a company helping somebody to reinvent, I'm either a villain or a crazy, but I'm never a hero. Then I can go to others who are in the same boat and vent a little bit. So it's creating a safety network for yourself. So that you can bounce ideas off, you can get support, and you can survive this extremely difficult process of making the leap of faith into a new version of you. I love that. And there's a saying I live by, which is wolves don't lose sleep over the opinion of sheep, which (laughs) which basically means you can't care. Because when somebody starts getting upset and starts criticizing you, you're making progress. It's almost a rite of passage. You're getting there. You're making some progress because if you want to avoid criticism, do nothing. Just stay and stagnate and, and entropy and die. You know, that's what happens. But let's move on to one of the next markers because excessive attachment to the past success is a huge reason for Titanic syndrome. Absolutely. So when we look at the companies that and did not make it either in our portfolio. So we came to a company and it's already almost bankrupt, or we looked at the histories of companies, famous or not famous. In every time when you ask them why didn't change something, the justification was past data. We have past data where we did something and it was successful, and we use that as a reference for future decision making. That sounded eerie, eerily similar to what happened on Titanium. Because at the moment of collision, the person who was at the wheel, uh, the decision maker, the chief decision maker, was not the captain. If you remember the movie, which was done very well, the captain at that point was already sleeping. And the person at the wheel was First Officer Murdoch, a wonderful gentleman, by all accounts, diligent, caring, professional, not arrogant (laughs) in, in terms of the outside behavior really humble man who had a long naval career. And what was he known for? He was actually in the newspapers. He was very known. He had a very huge personal brand. And that brand was all about avoiding collision. He's been known to save ships at the very last moment. There's a very famous story when he was on another ship, Arabic. And that ship 
almost collided with another ship that unexpectedly came out of the darkness. And he did a number of very fast decisions that were so successful that none of the two ships were damaged and passed within the inches of each other. So at the moment of collision, Officer Murdoch did exactly what his past success taught him to do. He repeated um, all the motions and he did everything right if you judge it by past data. The problem is the new reality was not conducive or com- competitive or com- comparative. It was not fit for the past data. He was working on a new ship with a new technology. And a lot of scientists today say that if he just did nothing and the ship hit the iceberg head on instead of hitting it sideways, the ship would be damaged, but it would not sink because five of those containers that should have not been damaged. If you remember, the Titanic was built in a way that if more than four were damaged, it would sink. Five of those containers would not be damaged compartments. So a lot of the time, and I'm as guilty as any of us, a lot of the time I'm sitting in a business meeting with my own team and I have some junior people in the team and they propose something. And my answer is, no, we've already done that. It won't work. And I'm using best data. But the problem is my best data, what brought me to success in the past might be exactly what kills me in the future because the speed of change and the complexity of change is so high. So being able to detach ourselves from our past success as an organization, as an individual, becomes a huge, huge part of what it means to reinvent again and again. You mentioned there as well, it's the individual level as well. So sometimes we hold on to ideas of who we used to be. And by doing that, we don't open new doors. We don't let new information in because we may have been successful at one thing in the past. And it can often kill us in our careers because maybe that thing we were successful at is no longer relevant. And trying to fight to preserve it becomes a downfall for ourselves, for our company, and for the community. You can see it with many professions that are disappearing right now. It's a personal tragedy. When I I live in a rural Ohio, I'm sure that's the same history for many of the small cities in Ireland, in UK, in um, all over Europe and other places where there was a lot of pride and identity built into a profession, let's say a coal mining community. And realizing that that past was wonderful and glorious, and it's time to keep what's best from that past, but let go of what is no longer serving us, is a very, very difficult competence and a very big, big step of courage that is required from all of us. Not to negate that identity, not to disrespect it, to honor it, but to build from it so it doesn't become our prison. The last marker you talked about was an inability to recognize the new and emerging reality. At the story of Titanic, there is a very famous, horrible incident, which is, where were the binoculars? And at the time of a collision, there were two people responsible for spotting potential disruptions. They were sitting in a crow nest. It's a a, a little open air cubicle on top of a mast. And two people who were watching were not drunk, not irresponsible. Any of the idea that they were not doing their job are completely off. They were very fresh. They just started their two-hour shift. They were new. They were healthy. They were paying attention. The only thing they didn't have is binoculars. And it's hard to imagine a ship today in 2019 that doesn't have binoculars on board with all of our high tech. How come they didn't have it in 1912? Well, the binoculars were on board, but they were locked up. And the reasons why they were locked up is because there was last time executive leadership decision that was made. And the person who was in charge of binoculars was let go at the first step, at the first stop of the ship. And he took away the keys with him. And nobody thought of a necessity to to break the cupboard because it was not a safe. It was a simple cupboard. Nobody thought it was necessary. And every time I come into a company today, and ask them, what are your binoculars? How do you spot in the trend? What is the mechanism by which you notice that something new is going on? The lack of binoculars is staggering. Absolute majority of people do not have people who work in business today, with the exception of few functions like sales. 
do not have a first-hand experience with customers. They have no clue what is the product performance in real life. What does it happen? What happens to our product? What does our customer think about our product? Absolute majority of people never had a first-time experience talking to a supplier. They think somehow magically raw materials show up. Absolute majority of people don't have a first-time experience talking to a, a political uh, atmosphere, political stakeholder who creates regulations for our business to be in. We are so detached from the sea in which we are navigating that it's no wonder that when this Titanic, when the iceberg shows up, it's like a huge mystery to us. Developing the skill of foresight distributed through the whole company becomes crucial. You mentioned there information. So if we rely on the same old information, we'll get the same old output. And it's one of the things about foresight is that we always look to the same places. We always rely on the same type of consultancy firms who all get the information from best practices, but best practices are no longer relevant because you could be following the practices of, an, of another Titanic. You need to look for best principles, which are maybe different ocean liners, maybe airplanes, maybe underwater vehicles, whatever it may be. You need to look elsewhere to look for different information. And let me give you a very pragmatic example of how to make it happen so we don't stay at the theoretical level. So what we do as a routine with every organization we work with is we connect them to a young population. And that is such a cheap solution. A local school, a local university is ready to give you insights into the future that are far more textured and complex and nuanced than any consultant can give because they are the sign of the future trend. So creating a partnership, setting up a partnership with a local university or a school where there is an assignment for a class to spot the trends specifically for your business, for your industry, for your reality, and present those trends to you every half a year, every semester, is exceptionally cheap thing to do. You may need a couple of um, prizes for the best teams and time. That's it. You don't need to pay anyone anything, generally speaking, to make this happen. But you will be amazed at what kind of insights the youngsters will bring you about the future of your industry. For example, we work with the insurance business and we ask a young group um, all over the world to brainstorm and propose insurable cases of the future, what should be insured in the future. It was unbelievable and it was far beyond anything the business or consulting could prepare or imagine. This is what we're talking about. It's not about huge budgets. It's about creative ways to build connections with the future. And by the way, this, this mechanism will also allow you to spot talent. It is a huge investment into improvement of quality of education. It's a win-win for everyone involved. Yeah, I love that. I, I had a personal experience with that when I was head of digital and innovation for a media group going back. Maybe it's five years now, but I partnered with a university and it's how I got into being a lecturer, a university lecturer. I made it easy for the student, for the lecturer as well. And I said, how about I give your students a project? I'll give them a real life scenario, which is media, which is a Titanic that's sinking and tell them all the facts, the stats, etc., and let them come back and go, what would they do if they were rebuilding or reimagining radio and what elements would they include? Have a look at our apps. What are we missing? What can they see that we are no longer seeing because we're not relevant anymore? And the amazing feedback I got back, and I implemented many, many of the ideas, the ones that were most practical, and it totally changed the stats of the downloads, of the use of the app, etc. It was an absolutely revelationary aspect of the business. Beautiful. So everyone who is listening, you can do this at the individual level as well. You can create a standard dinner with your friends every six months where you are all brainstorming for each other. I actually have a standing coffee with a number of groups, my personal advisory board, who gives me the same kind of insights and there are youngsters in that advisory board. Every six months, I ask my personal advisory board on what am I spotting probably poorly, 
what would they suggest I should pay attention to? What do they think? What is a better way to solve the problem I'm solving? You can do this at the personal level, at the organization level, and it doesn't need to cost anything but your time and effort. I love that. I hadn't thought of that at the personal level. Obviously, honesty and accepting feedback is a huge part of that. Let's move into reinvention because this is where we've talked about a lot of the issues, but let's talk about what you mean by reinvention. Reinvention for me is a system of embracing change. So when I say reinvention, I speak about an an onion that you can peel at many layers. This is a combination of the mindset and culture. Yes, a different mindset, a different relationship with change is crucial. Um, Two big elements of a traditional um, risk-averse changes bad mindset. We call it built-to-last mindset versus built-to-reinvent mindset is two basic assumptions is Change is super rare and change is disruptive. It's a threat. And switch it to changes every day. It's all around us. It's a normal part of life. It's not a rare black swan event. And change it to change is an opportunity. And suddenly exact same event happening to you will be seen in a completely different way. The way you shared with your son, that beautiful quote on changing the way you see things and suddenly they will look completely different and be completely different. But it's also about very tangible things. So it's creating systems, not just the soft stuff, but hard stuff. How do you design a company that reinvents automatically as a self-preservation mechanism? How do you do that at the level of uh, budgeting and finance? What does it mean in operations and productions? What does it mean in marketing and sales? And there are very few industries who do this well, and some do it well at some level, but with some unintended consequences. For example, fashion industry is the only industry as a a standard reinvents itself with every season. Uh, There's hardly any other industry that does that. Of course, a lot of waste generated in the process, so they will have to reinvent that. But how do you create a whole system in which change is normal, is a Somebody listened in our community to what I had to say, and they say they said beautiful thing that I now um, use all the time. Change is not a bug, it's a feature. So how do you create a system in which change is not a bug, it's a feature? That's what reinvention is for me. The current definition we use is a, it's a practice of embracing change by reimagining, remaking something so that it manifests significantly new and improved attributes, qualities, and results. But the crucial part of this is embracing change. Instead of being reactionary, embrace it and proactively ride the waves of change, noticing them before they crush you, preparing your ship before it's too late, and riding them to a greater opportunity and greater flourish. I love at the end of the book, Nadia, you ask a very fundamental question, and you ask some great questions throughout the book, but this one is absolutely necessary. And I quote, Since reinvention is all about change, it seems logical that leadership should play the most important role in the process of organizational renewal, or should it? It's a big question for me because it's a a big discussion on what leadership means. And you know in the book, because we had this discussion offline as well, is uh, there is a juxtaposition of leadership and management that is happening in most businesses in the academic environment. And unfortunately, uh, we are swinging pendulum in directions that I'm not really um, in, in favor of. So if you think of the old command and control businesses of the 20th century, of the 19th century, the pendulum was all around management. It's around coping with complexity through control, through fear, through organization, through systems, through processes, through rigid structures. And of course, on its own, Management as the only tool is not suitable for the reality of fast-moving world. Then we went to another extreme where everything became about leadership. Now that the speed of change is high, everything is about leadership. We obsess around leadership courses. Most sexy jobs are leadership jobs, and management is a kind of boring thing. The reality is you need both. You need a balance between the two. You need a cocktail. And the combination of leadership and management practices, the precise 
recipe for that cocktail depends exactly on the place in the cycle you are in. When you're going through the transformation, when you're kicking off the process of reinvention, when you're starting a new cycle and creating a new business model, yes, leading change is a more important role. But once you blew up the old system, there has to be somebody who comes and organizes the pieces into a new reality. And that's where management is. And I would invite all of you to separate the idea of leadership and management from leaders and managers. All of us do leadership and management activities every day. And the exact same activity can serve the purpose of leadership or management. For example, brushing teeth. When you're teaching your kid to brush teeth and you find toothpaste on your ceiling, that's a leadership activity because you're driving change. But you, when you're brushing teeth yourself this morning, that's a management activity. So you're organizing the complexity and reducing the complexity of your everyday life. It's exact same activity. It didn't make any difference. The difference is the purpose. So leadership and management go hand in hand. And depending on the pers- purpose, you need a different mix of all. So in my company, for example, when we are going through the periods of um, it's time to change, it's time to move to the next level. In my personal cocktail, 70% of the efforts and steps and time I invest is into leadership activity, into kicking change into gear. But when we are already over the hump, most of my life is management activity, and I love it as much. So finding that balance becomes very, very important if we want the system to survive and respecting both sides. Because usually people who love one type of activity look down on so people who love leadership activity look down on those boring bureaucratic management lovers and management lovers usually hate the disruptive crazy entrepreneur leadership types so respecting each other becomes crucial there's one key element you talk about in the book which really stood out to me where people are asked to innovate and innovation itself the word can be very very scary for people which is why you prefer the word reinvention let's share the law of diffusion and what that means to businesses because here you tell us no more than 2.5 percent of people can actually innovate and that is only if the corporate culture hasn't beaten it out of them by now that's a tiny fraction of the company and when you ask people to innovate within a company it's no wonder that we freeze and we fail oh absolutely so um, most of innovation is not exactly yet studied enough at the neurological level, but my bet is that this is a neurological predisposition. What has been studied is how does it look on the outside, and that is the law of diffusion of innovation. It's been around for more than 50 years. It's been researched quite heavily to say, yes, this pattern does repeat itself in most human systems. And what does this observation look like? About 2.5% of the world are innovators. These are people who love creating completely new stuff. This is their neurological predisposition. They can't help it. It happens automatically. It comes out of them. And every picture you have of the crazy professor is probably an innovator who has too many things jumping out of their nervous system and they don't have enough support around them to process it. Then there is about 13.5% that we call early adapters. These are people who might not always invent new ideas. Occasionally they do, but it's not an everyday event for them. But they are people who are ready to test new ideas. They live for it. These are the people who line up the streets waiting for the new iPhone or the first ever flat screen TV to come out. These are people who pride themselves in trying something new. And they're the one who will tell the early majority, which is the next 34%, Yes, that flat screen TV is worth it, buy it. Or no, it was a crappy product, don't. They are the kind of testers of the system. So then the early majority is about 34%, and then the late majority is about another 34%. And then we have laggards. These are the people who switch from a rotary phone to a phone with buttons only because the rotary phone is no longer sold. And for the young listeners who don't know what a rotary phone is, you can Google it and you will be puzzled by how we live with rotary phones. There's a beautiful <laughs> video recently with two teenagers dared by their father to use their rotary phone in 10 minutes, and they didn't. They just couldn't figure out how to use it, <laughs> which was very sweet to watch. So what does this law tell us? 
when we are peddling the idea of innovation as this all encompassing savor of modern business, it's wonderful. It should be done. And only about 2%, 2.5% of the world population can actually participate in that. The rest of the world freezes and runs away in fear, at least in their own head. And we actually study that. We do surveys of every group we ever work with. And it still holds true. Very small percentage of people get excited or feel empowered and supported and able to innovate. Most of them, however, if you reframe the same challenge, instead of telling them, invent a new process for me or invent a new product, if you reframe the challenge slightly and ask them to propose one improvement idea, one reinvention, they would have brainstorms for hours. So it's helping the the normal, non-inventive type of us, and I belong to that group as well. I'm definitely an early adopter more than I am an innovator. Helping us, creating a, an environment in which it's easier for us to come up with something new, uh, bridging the gap between the innovation and the rest of the world is uh, our big mission because I truly believe we have done injustice making all of our bets, putting all of our coins on innovation and forgetting that absolute majority of us are not able to engage in that activity productively. The show is called The Innovation Show. And one of the reasons I called it that is because it means so many things to so many people and it's so broad. And that's one of the reasons, like, I'll change it now to The Reinvention Show, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I think back over the motivation of the show, I actually probably should have called it The Curiosity Show because it is so broad. I just felt the the definition you say and in the book, you say innovation frames the challenges as something disruptive while reinvention suggests that you can improve what you already have. I love that because that's where we should be coming from. That's where we should be evolving from. We are not broken. We're not stupid. We may have made mistakes, but mistakes give you wisdom if you learn from the mistakes. And I think that's a real lesson that I took from the book, both as an individual, but also as a business, that that's where we need to come from. If, Nadia, you had one message to give a business or a person, what would that be? It's simple. You don't have a choice. Either you will be changed or you choose to change. I hope you don't give up your powers, whether for your business or for your life, to somebody else for some trend, for some disruption to choose for you. So I hope you choose to reinvent before you're forced to. And I hope you make change your friend. Treat this as an opportunity. There's so much we didn't get through. I sent you my notes. I think we got through like a tenth of them. But there's so much in the book. There's case studies. You give away business cards, which are fantastic with all different types of business models. Where can people find out more about you and your work and the book, etc.? The easiest way to get in into just titanicsyndrome.com and you will get onto our site and roam through it. You can get free samples. You can get the 15 business model reinvention cards together with some exercises and tons of other things, videos and so on. Titanicsyndrome.com. Author of Titanic Syndrome, Why Companies Sink and How to Reinvent Your Way Out of Any Business Disaster, Dr. Nadia Zekzembayeva. Thank you for joining us. My great pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.